Welcome to Human Tech, a podcast about the intersection between humans and technology. My name is Guthrie. I am here with Susan. Hello, Susan. Hey, Guthrie. And today we all we have a very special guest with us. We have Yanis Boya, founder of a community of peer groups. Uh, hello, Yanis. Hello, Guthrie. Hello, Susan. Thank and you very I, much for having me. And can I uh, y- the I tried to get those Scandinavian um, uh, tonal sounds right, and I, I never can quite do a good job with it. Uh, but Sus- Susan's a little better because she uh, was nearly fluent in French, at least in some point of her life. So, And you think that's going to help me with uh, uh, other languages? Well, there's the, the nuance of some of the... <laughs> I think it's stuff. really that I really enjoy... Uh, learning languages and also i seem to have some kind of like you know like a pretty good ear um and i think it might have been because i moved around a lot when i was young and and i've always been uh, i i actually am a pretty good imitator of different like accents in the u.s so that might have something to do with it Uh, i don't know but i'm sure all of our language skills pale in comparison to yada's here well, that's probably true. That's how, because how many languages do do you speak? Yeah, how many languages do you speak, Giannis? I speak three languages, English being one, and then my mother tongue is Danish. I'm from Denmark. I'm in Copenhagen right now for this recording. Very fun. And then I've also had the pleasure of living five years in Germany, which, as I'm sure you know, is the right way to learn any accent or language is by actually living there, moving around, like you said, Susan. Uh, but so those are three that you can, but are there any that you could like order like a sandwich? In? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, uh, it's a really good intro because I can make connections to this really in what I do. Yeah. Uh, and we'll talk about that in a second. Yeah. I, I would probably be able to order a sandwich in a few more languages. Um, yeah. Every, everyone uh, uh, that we've back met. To the, they're so humble. Back to the history of uh, Denmark, you know, we used to be even more connected with our neighbors in Sweden and Nor- Norway, uh, despite the fact that we were at war with each other for seven, eight hundred years. Uh, the languages are really near each other. So Danish is not that different uh, to Swedish and Swedish and Danish is not that different to Norwegian. Of course, as I'm sure everybody listening already knows, Finnish is a totally different thing. <laughs> uh, but sandwiches will probably be okay in, in Swedish and Norwegian. A little bit the sad part today is that we all look to the West. I'm not saying looking towards England or the US is a bad thing. But I think also one should be, uh, if possible, good friends and, you know, have a good understanding with one's neighbors and uh, so that was a part of when I grew up also of course being really fascinated with the Danish islands uh, the Faroe Islands and and Greenland although I don't speak those local languages yeah Uh, every so so we've had uh, I mean for for some reason or another we've we've done a lot of work and met a lot of people you included um, in I, I'm not sure exactly what to call the region, but between, uh, you know, the... the Old the, Europe? Oh, is that it, Old Europe? Yeah, the, the, the uh, uh, you know, the Sweden and Norway and Germany and that, that part. And of course, so, and you know, we, we, we like to ask people, you know, because we're always so impressed, you know, especially as Americans, we, we don't, we're not taught foreign languages at a young age. So by the time we're interested in foreign languages, it's too hard or it's not too hard, but it's very, very difficult to learn. Yeah, we're we're just basically of... lazy and hopeless. No, 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 no. It, it has to do with the neuron p- pruning, <laughs> which, yeah, which we, we talked about that, a lot. We it's, can say that, yeah, which is true. At, but the, at still... the age of 12, the brain pure, prunes back neurons. And so if you haven't yeah, started learning yeah. language, it's much harder. Well, Anyways, um, and so, uh, you know, and, and we, we talk to people and they're always so humble and modest. And they're like, oh, I don't speak any other languages. And then we're like, well, yeah, but like, could you have a conversation with her? It's like, oh yeah, you know, Portuguese <laughs> and Spanish, and you know, I, you know, I, I, I lived in China for a year, and it's just like, you know, they can like speak all these different languages. Um, they're always yeah, so we're jealous. Um, and well, all, and you. you made all of my Finnish friends who are listening smile as well, because <laughs> they, 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 
they they like carrying that badge of honor that they are completely different from everyone else. Um, I like Finland a lot. I the love trends, of course. So okay, so let's let's talk about um, you, you what you founded. I, I think I think that's where the you were segueing before I got um, I got distracted. So uh, first for for those listening, uh, what where where are these peer groups and what what are they? And when yes. did they be- come into existence? Thank you. Um, so my background briefly is that I actually used to work for U.S. companies. I used to work for a U.S. digital agency building websites, essentially in the late 90s when websites was quite an innovative thing. Just having one was quite an innovative thing. And then later on, I was almost five years with a Boston-based software vendor, and uh, you know, way before the technology p- progress that we have today. But it was really interesting, and I learned a lot. And after a couple of years, as you can imagine, there was an element of repetition, even though it was an innovative, fast-moving space as it still is today. One of the things that I really liked was that I had this feeling that being with a software vendor was kind of the top of the food chain because you got to be able to sometimes influence the next version of the product and see the innovations that could come and into the marketplace and shape, you know, shape the future and transform organizations. On the other hand, a frustrating element was that, you know, in hindsight, the technology didn't really work. Everybody, including ourselves, had difficulties making version 2.1 work, and certainly the local integrators couldn't make it work. And it was a little bit frustrating working for a software company that wasn't any better or any worse than the competitors at the time, but it was a little bit frustrating working in a place where after six to nine to 12 months, there weren't really any happy customers. Uh, because the projects failed. They certainly ran over budget, they certainly ran over time, and I think also around the table there was a general sense of having underestimated the complexity. You know, back then the mentality was, hey, this is written in Java, how hard can it be? I have Java programmers. And then we'll take this piece of software and build a website with it and whatever else we need. But what I really liked uh, at those years, both in the agency and also later at the software window, was when I had the opportunity to go to user group meetings or informal gatherings of customers where they could speak to each other and learn from each other. And there was this feeling of meaning and purpose, in particularly when from time to time the, the sales and marketing people did not get to go, but the customers could really uninterrupted talk to each other and have conversations, not necessarily without an agenda, like just like this one, uh, perhaps with some friendly moderation. Uh, but I really felt, wow, this is valuable. The customers are learning so much from talking to each other. They don't have to reinvent the wheel. They can avoid making some of the same mistakes. And hopefully, ultimately, they can build even better solutions. And you know, it can support their personal career. It can support their organizations. It made a lot of sense. So when at some point in 2003, I came back to Denmark, having met my my then girlfriend and later fiance and wife, um, I thought, hey, I didn't want to work for another agency or do another software company. I was kind of scratching my head and thinking, I'm wondering whether doing something like a user group is something I could make a living out of. And to be completely honest, uh, because I think that's what this podcast is also about, the deep insights. Uh, I did a lot of consulting for the first almost decade to fund this project Um, but really uh, what the focus was to to make these peer groups which in the beginning was really user groups and people who met on the customer side of the table to learn from each other they may have used different vendors at different agencies but then they paid an annual subscription and it's a really simple formula we it's an annual subscription they meet three to four times a year for a six or seven hour meeting in working hours and then uh, there's a moderator or host lead coach from our side at the beginning that was me of course at all the meetings now i don't i can't go to all the meetings and uh, but then we learn from each other and uh, a little bit like this intro 
it's about uh, being able to work with complexity like languages without simplifying it. It's about connecting on a deeper level with peers, building real meaningful relationships that hopefully last a lifetime. But it's also about working with meaning and purpose over uh, personal gains. And it's very much about the, uh, the results and the journey to the results. And so that's what we talk about. The common denominator since I started has been very much everything happening with digital. Uh, and so we've had groups focused on digital marketing. I had the distinct pleasure of being the host of a group meeting where the two of you came to Copenhagen last year, which was a group focused on digital communication. And we have project management groups and UX groups. And today I was at a group meeting at an insurance company where we focused on the discipline of online analytics. So there's so many things going on. And I think the magic really happens when the composition is right. When we have 15, no more than 20 people in the room, uh, who have similar roles in in organizations, uh, different organizations willing to learn from each other, willing to uh, perhaps put themselves a little bit on the line saying, hey, I don't have the, all the answers. My manager might expect me to have all the answer, but I've taken this day out of the, you know, out of the calendar to go to this meeting to uh, bring myself out there and, you know, ask for your input. And that's when it works the best, as you can imagine. That's when the magic really happens. We are slowly but truly going away from presentations. There can still be a presentation from time to time. But for example, when you came to Copenhagen, it was a conversation like this one. And then the participants, the members learned a lot about motivation and the conversation we had about how to get people to do stuff. Yeah, I, w I, I'm, uh, I think when we met in Copenhagen, and we met and talked after the event we were at. And I said, I'm just really fascinated with this uh, medium as a way for people to to learn and to uh, mentor others and to connect. Um, I think it's really powerful. And uh, there's, um, I remember years ago, I went to a, a training class for trainers, you know, a train the trainer kind of thing. Um, and it was called, I think, the Accelerated Learning Workshop. Uh, uh, and it was just, it was, it was for people who, you know, do classes, but to learn uh, different techniques to, instead of teach the class, to um, help people that are in the class to get in touch with what they already know, and then to connect that to new information. And, and just very concrete uh, uh, you know, ways to run a workshop that I, I had been m moving towards uh, on my own, but here you know, was an opportunity to understand why it was different and why it was important. And I, you know, ever since I've, I've I've brought that into all my workshops. And the idea is that there's a couple ideas behind that kind of learning and, and workshop format that I think is it has um, some bearing on, on what you do with the peer groups too, which is if, first of all, you know, if you have adults who are actually quite knowledgeable, right? I mean, these are people who... I've been doing, you know, working for at least a little bit and they're bright and they're, you know, they have knowledge and capability and understanding and insights. And so if you activate those, right, um, rather than have people come into a room and listen to a presentation and then they're very passive and they're just listening and they're all in their head, uh, kind, kind of filtering what's being said by the presenter. But instead of that, if you really activate their uh, own knowledge um, and have them bring that out uh, to start w before you start learning, before you start talking about something new, it allows that person to 
learn and, and understand and incorporate the you know new information they may hear um, it, it much more deeply and in, in a much more complex way. And it also then allows them to uh, you know share with other people what they know, which then means that the learning of the whole group is accelerated, right? Because it's not just one person, the teacher doing exactly. the teaching, but now everybody is is the teacher. And it also is extremely engaging. You know, it's um, I, I go. You, you know, you probably go to conferences. I go to conferences, and 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 I speak at conferences, and these are really great conferences and with amazing, amazing speakers, you know, and, and, but the problem is you, you sit, you're so passive, you know, you sit there in an audience of 1500 people and the next presenter comes on and they give their talk and the next presenter comes on and they give their talk. And no matter how good it is or how interested you are, it's just kind of numbing. And I have found, you know, when I'm at the, these conferences, when, the breaks, the networking breaks, when you go and talk to other people about what the speaker just said, are sometimes the places where I, you know, learn the most and have the most, you know, understanding of of what just went on because I got to hear what somebody else, you know, thought about it, and that stimulates something in my mind as well. So I think it's just such a brilliant um, uh, thing you've done with these with these, uh, peer groups and it's still, I, you know, I, and I know that you're, you've set these up and, you know, that you're very, you know, the particular things you're doing, like the size of the group and the, the topics. And I'd like to hear maybe more about how you choose the topics and about bring, you know, having the groups be together for a long period of time. It's not just, you know, the group, the same group or, or pretty much the same group meets over and over, that these are all really important aspects of, of what you've put together. So I, I'd maybe like to hear you talk a little bit more about that. But I just want to, you know, say, I think it's interesting to me, this doesn't seem, I mean, I think it's really unique. I haven't, uh, it doesn't seem to be a planned thing that most people uh, in their professional life, you know, are part of. I, I think sometimes these groups, ha- you know, it might happen uh, kind of accidentally or organically, but to have a, you know, a planned situation like you've put together to really want to bring these people together in this way, you know, why do you think that's so unusual in, in, our, in our working life today? I have definitely seen around... Eight, nine years ago, we tried to set up our very first group outside Denmark in the UK, in London. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure everybody, many people at least listening, know London, you know, this busy humming place. uh, And, you know, we were struggling. How does this translate, you know, not just from Danish to English, using different words, what should we call it? Could we just call it, call it a group because everybody knows what a group is, but that's kind of deprived of meaning. We called it in the beginning a community of practice and and used that kind of lingo around it. And then we sometimes had to do a little bit of explanation. But I think over the years I've seen that there's something Scandinavian, if not uniquely Danish, then certainly Scandinavian, about emphasizing group work more, about having more acceptance in organizations that it's okay to go into this third place, uh, go into this group. It's not your office. It's not your project. It's not a conference either, but go into this place and then speak openly. It's a confidential setting. So what gets set there stays there, but that's also the way to really make it valuable. And it, it seems like there is a higher social acceptance and also, of course, managerial Willingness to pay for this, not just the money for the annual subscription for a seat, but also the willingness to take these days on. I think the time is the bigger investment, you know, that's scary. And and we've heard that quite often also, as we then a few years later expanded into having groups on the East Coast that we got all these kind of questions like, why would I ever pay for that? I'm on LinkedIn. I can already network. Why would I ever pay for this? There is, you know, in New York, something happening every day. And 
in London, of course, something happening every day. I don't have to pay money for that. I have my own network. I can go to the pub and so on and so forth. And and then as we sometimes offered them to say, hey, you can try it out. Why don't, you know, if everything else fits and you're carefully vetted and you're not vetoed by the existing members and you can meet the rules like it's, you know, respect that it's confidential, then go ahead and try it. And then it's really been an eye opener and it still is here in 2018 from for so many people like, wow, there's somebody else out there that are struggling with some of the same things I'm struggling with. And and you know, we don't have that same exclusive digital focus at as we did uh, five, ten years ago. Now it's much more aligned with this podcast at the intersection of humans brain science and technology, it's much more broader. It almost seems silly in 2018 to have a group called digital communication because what's communication that's not digital, there's still some of that out there, but but we talk broader. We don't have intranet groups. We talk about employee experience and the workplace of the future. So normally there is a theme that gets people excited that people are passionate about that people perhaps work really hard in the organizations about and that's kind of the the foundation for bringing people together but we also have groups that's been active for eight nine years and really that's a j boy group and um, it makes no sense to call it the same name it was called eight nine years ago because that topic has evolved so much and now it's really people who like to meet each other, who the group gets filled up when people leave. And then we make hopefully a relevant agenda program and everybody contributes and there's, there's the value in it. And to be honest, we haven't taken a direct path from A to B. I think few people does. And so there's been a lot of learnings and trial and error over the years. And we've had groups that were too small. We've had group meetings that were too big. and. All those kind of experiments have led us to where we are today. Certainly not perfect. Uh, the product has been refined, but still a long journey ahead of us for this project. But like I said, I think it makes a lot of sense. And it's fun for me, certainly. I find it a lot of fun and rewarding to get to know people in this format and see them regularly three to five times during the year and follow their progression. And then when I succeed, sometimes see how the membership is filled with life and meeting in between the meetings, because mm. that's the trick. Not just having it as a conference, like you said. I, there are good conferences out there. I, we have two as well. One in Denmark every year in, in November, to to name one. Uh, but many conferences out there are not that good, and people may come because it's nice to go to Florida in January. It's nice and warm. But there's not enough learning and valuable networking to really justify the, the long trip. It's more like treated like a reward to the good employee. Hey, you get mm. this trip, then please don't ask for a, a salary increase. Uh, here's this trip you can go on. And I think that's not how it should be. Then, you know, take some vacation if that's what you need. But conferences, these kind of settings where we bring two people together, the peer groups, it should really be about learning should be about progress. Uh, our theme for this year is creating together. We want to create things together with the participants. And uh, I'm really looking forward to filling that with life over the coming 12 months. Well, I, it, I, I, go, I just, go ahead, Catherine. Yeah, I, just I, say I, quick, I have a question. Yeah, just a quick point. It, and it's, it's, um, it's twice as bad in the States when standard practice is to get one or two weeks of vacation a year. Um, maybe maybe three, and so right. if you get to go to a conference, if you, like if if your if your employer is sending you on a three day conference, that's like a quarter of your entire like yeah. that's like like having a quarter of your vacation for the year. So you know, so it's just it, there there's there's really is a you know a huge desire at the conference to have fun and to yes. relax and to network um, and you know learn some stuff too. But there are. Um, stronger factors at play, I think. Go ahead. That's a very good point. Yeah, I have a question, which is, um, what's uh, what's one thing that you thought in, in the peer groups would work, like you were really excited about trying, and then it turned out to, to not work at all? 
Sure. The list is long. <laughs> Again, like I said, it hasn't been a straight line from A to B. You know, I think it's not not by design, but I think consciously, unconsciously, this develop this relationship develops between me or the other great people on my team and the participants. A little bit like a teacher student kind of relationship, right? We tell them carefully that you're adults, you know, please don't come to these groups and expect us to have the answers. We're going to flesh these out together and create something together. Yet, you know, people sometimes come and then they look at us and say, hey, you see all these things, you must have the answer. And and uh, we've been struggling to sometimes find the, the right feet to stand on. But, but to give a direct answer to the excellent question, uh, very, way back in the beginning, we identified common pains, like uh, it seemed there was a lot of problems getting management buy-in. Many were complaining about lack of resources. I think that's universal still today. And many were kind of questioning, how would you set up the organization? Where should we, digital natives, digital front runners, where should we be based? And so we put on the agenda for a lot of meetings that we'll, we'll talk about this. Everybody send in a slide or two with your org chart. And then we'll, uh, we'll try to see if we can use the wisdom of the crowd to come up with something. But as you can imagine, that does not go well when only one person comes prepared, right? <laughs> and it's like, oops, nobody else saw the memo or got their homework done. We don't really want to call it homework because that's also for a different place for a different time. But that's just one time where I've kind of had the feeling as a host, I've had to do a little bit of juggling and say, all right, we'll just use your example at BMW and then we'll try to see pros and cons and did not really go the way it was intended. Mm -hmm. But um, I think that's the, the real trick, the secret sauce, if you like, uh, your reward for having listened to this for already perhaps 20 minutes is the composition. And that's still really hard for us, as I'm sure it is for others doing something similar to put on a formula in advance. You know, you can look at people's CVs. It's a lot easier these days than it was 10 years ago now when everybody has a lot of details on social media and particularly LinkedIn. But still, people sometimes turn up and we go through all the careful vetting and all of the steps and the hoops and the sense of exclusivity and then they turn up and they just don't fit. And that can really... Uh, have a negative impact on uh, on, a, on, a, on one of our sessions. What, what do you do it, when it that can, happens? It can for sure be really tough as, as a host, you know, it's like, you know, you bring people to your house that you don't really know. People, you know, behaved. It's not like they're tearing up the place. But, you know, there can be, you know, an example could be in Germany when we had a group meeting that I attended with a lot of strong alpha males, which I think, to be honest, um, saw this more as a seminar series. Yes, we called it peer groups. I believe we gave them all the explanation required so that they could see that this is not a seminar or a conference series. But OK, at the end of the day, I think what they heard was as a seminar series. So they turned up and then they kind of expected me to be the instructor. And that required a little bit of uh, smoke and mirrors or quick, you know, steps on the feet. And it was, it was difficult, you know, that's, I, I felt, you know, I did, I felt I was missing uh, some tools in my toolbox to do that in the right way. It's almost like being set back because I always look forward to these and, you know, people come from different places, from different organizations, travel there, enter the, the meeting door at the law firm and then when people are there and they just don't get along, which because this is a human business, it happens from time to time. Two or three people have a bad day. One is coughing and half sick and the other three are perhaps a little bit more junior than it looked like on the LinkedIn profile and uh, in the brief uh, vetting calls we had over the phone. It's it's tricky and um, 
time and travel, etc., doesn't always allow to have a cup of coffee in person with everybody, but but that is the best. So sometimes it means that we have to like almost go back to the drawing board and said, hey, we need to recalibrate this group and you may need to go over here. And actually, it may not make sense for you to be in a group at all. You may, you know, perhaps you should go to a conference instead and submit, uh, you know, some presentations and talk about your great case study. You know, it's, there's something there about the chemistry that when it works, it's magic. But when it doesn't work, it can almost be like pulling out teeth. It can be quite mm. hard and uh, painful. And that's that's been still, uh, there's a lot of learnings in that for us, how to go through the vetting, make it pleasant, make fe people feel welcome. It's not a test. There's no exam at the end of a group meeting. Yet, if you're just sitting there and, uh, you know, you're going into the back row expecting all the answers or you're looking into your smartphone all day, I've had participants like that too. They give it five minutes and, oh, there's this lady from the U.S. I don't know who she is. And then you can just tell in their body language they fade. Mm -hmm. And the same thing happens at conferences too. But at conferences, I think it matters less. Often at conferences, you are much more than 15 to 20 people. And yeah. so what if you decide just to stay in the hallway and never walk back into a session? It's not, it's not, it's really just your own problem. Yeah. But at, the, at a group meeting with 15 people, it becomes every body's problem and so we've also sometimes have uh, people leave uh, at lunchtime and say all right I gotta get back to the office and then we don't see them again and that's okay it's not something that's a natural fit for everybody and mm. that's taking me some time to learn as well yeah so do you sometimes have to have to remind yourself that you wanted to do this <laughs> <laughs> Actually not. Uh, no. Well, it was a big decision um, about a year ago where we decided let's finally, you know, consulting had been less of a priority for three to four years. Uh, and then finally a year ago we made the decision to say no more consulting, no more professional services, selling hours. Let's focus on the community of making the groups we have even better, finding new candidates for joining, mm -hmm. taking better care of the people who are already there. And then uh, from time to time, open a new group here and there and no more consulting. And mm. it's been such a great decision. It's really freed up also mental power to think about how to, you know, accelerate the learning uh, from our point of view for these groups to make it better. Uh, also to make the community more valuable in between the meetings to think of if not speakers, to think of guest stars like the two of you who joined this Copenhagen group meeting half year, things like that. We just never had time when we were doing a lot mm. of consulting and we're running around with the expectations to deliver and turn up at meetings and be a consultant. It's just totally a different way to engage with people. So I don't miss that. And I really feel privileged. Uh, like I said, we're not really putting digital at the forefront so much anymore. Yes, we talk digital a lot still, but we talk certainly much more than tools, but I really think it's a dream job to be behind the scenes in so many organizations to experience that sense of confidentiality and trust where people can share openly straight away, even with people that they don't know that well, and then see their magic happens. And we have a lot of, I, I feel, really good meetings where the value is there. You can always question, you know, did I get enough? of these five, six hours and the, there's no two group meetings alike. And sometimes on the agenda, there is perhaps only one or two things that is something you need right now. But it's also important for us to talk about broader themes like motivation or persuasion or the personal career perspective or work-life balance. And, and so it may not be things that you need straight away, but perhaps a little bit like going to an art museum. It's an opportunity to to stretch your mind and to, or oh, like reading a book, it's an, it's a window into another world that you can then hopefully take with you in the many decisions you need to make tomorrow uh, in the projects that you're involved in and in the, with the responsibility that you have. So how, how many, how long have you been doing this? So uh, I came back in uh, 2003 and the first group meeting, uh, first memberships was in 2004. Oh, so, so a long uh, time. Going at it for over a decade. And uh, yes, like I said, it's evolved uh, over the years. Uh, so have you found that the, that the, 
things that people are struggling with or or want help with or want to talk about has that changed over time or or does it you know does it tend to stay the same there's a lot of things that have stayed the same people are genuinely really interested in learning, you know, hearing from others, hearing those real unpolished stories of here's a project I did, we semi succeeded, we didn't have an epic fail. Here's the learnings along the way, the ups, the downs, that's still the same. Uh, I, I feel I'm braver now as a coach or host in not putting too much on the agenda. There was a lot of almost lecture style approach in the past. Uh, people are really interested in in having those conversations sometimes without too much steer about their personal career and all right i've been here for five years what should i do my manager doesn't get me some of those themes are very very much the same so uh, at the underlying level i don't see much change some of the same character traits traits as back then in terms of curiosity and honesty and transparency and being able to you know, share openly, also being a little bit of insecure, which is totally fine in these groups. That's the same. In terms of the, you know, the stuff that's happened in 13, 14 years, you know, it's unbelievable to think of that back then there was no iPads, there was no Skype, <laughs> there was no YouTube, uh, there was no Facebook, you know, it's like that was a different world, right? So, you know, we sometimes forget how fast it goes. And uh, so, of course, there are, moving parts, a lot of them, that uh, if I look at the agenda for a group meeting in 2009, I could probably tell, hmm, that's not, that's not recent and fresh, but a lot of the things that we talk about is perhaps more so than digital, we talk about transformation, we talk about culture change, we talk about reinventing organizations, and that's the same as back then. So what is, is there, is there something that you have felt that you'd like to try with the groups, but maybe you're hesitant to or not sure how it would work oh, or yeah. afraid to? Or I really had some, I still have some role models on my team, which are a lot braver than me uh, in terms of doing work sessions, uh, to just call it that, where you say, you know, let's, create a chatbot together, which would be a very 2018 thing to do. Uh, or let's uh, come up with a governance model or what have you. And so that's, that's also why we have creating together as the theme for 2018, because that's what we want. We want even less slides and PowerPoint bullets and much more saying, you know, here's the big topic could be, for example, accessibility. What's the different dimensions of that? Design, technology, organization, and content, and then let's spend hours on fleshing those out and divide into groups and working on it. I'm really looking forward to, to more of that. That's the, the direction where I hope that accelerated learning that you mentioned earlier, Susan, really comes into play because I fundamentally believe that people don't remember bullets or PowerPoint slides one or perhaps even one hour later or one day later, they don't. But if you do something together, if you create something together, it's a total, it sticks in a total different way. Mm -hmm. There's a different sense of connection and perhaps a, 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 you know, somebody who's an expert on behavioral and brain science would be able to explain it better than me, but I've seen it happen. And they go to a conference in Las Vegas or whatever else it might be in Amsterdam and they have one or two peaks and things they remember and that's it. But when you have a work session, it's totally different. They, they, it's like they master the skill much quicker and a totally different sense of empowerment, which I, I think is really what we need to accelerate the learning and to, to make progress. Yeah. And it's just, you know, to, um, I should do a shout out to, uh, the accelerated learning uh, workshop people. Um, I mean, it, boy, talk about years ago. I mean, it was probably in the 
late 1990s that I went to that workshop. So it was quite a long time ago, but it's, um, it's called the Center for Accelerated Learning. Actually, a Wisconsin company, yay, because that's where I am. Um, uh, and David Meyer was the uh, person who put that together. I don't know. He might have, I don't know if he's still doing the work. I know he had uh, back, you know, a decade, more than a decade ago, he was, uh, had his um, son join him in the business. So maybe it's his son that's that's primarily running it now. I'm not sure. But um yeah, I mean, what we know, uh, it, there's, it's interesting because it does have to do with how we learn and how we process information. And um, there's also a wonderful, um, there's a wonderful theory about learning that's been around for decades that I think doesn't doesn't get uh, enough uh, conversation in play, and it's it's just some very simple. Uh, I guess you could say heuristics about um, uh, how people learn different types of things. So if I'm trying to learn a, a fact, you know, like uh, uh, let's say, you know, the date of a of a certain historical battle during, you know, World War One or something, that's in order to learn and memorize that fact that um, there are there are certain things you can do to make it easier to learn and memorize that fact, but that mo- that way of learning is different than if you're trying to get people to um, learn a principle. Um, that that's a di- you know learning a principle is, is different, and you have to teach it in a different way. Uh, learning categories, you know, what is a mammal and what isn't a mammal is is different and so there's uh, ways to teach that well and this is kind of like the basics of instructional design that i think is so uh, powerful and i always find it interesting that um very few people know <laughs> know about it even people that you know teach for a living this is kind of you know new to them that there might uh, and I think a lot of times instructors and people who run seminars and even people perhaps who do the kind of um, facilitation of groups that you're doing, they have learned over the years what works and what doesn't. And, and they are kind of following these principles of instructional design, but they never realized they were principles of instructional design. They just, you know, they were just they're just doing what exactly. seems to work and letting go yep. of what doesn't doesn't seem to work. But there actually is a science around around how to do it. And, uh, it, it's, I remember when, um, I first started incorporating these ideas and some of what you're talking about, although I was, you know, teaching a class, which is not what you're doing. But I remember when I first started incorporating them, it was really scary. I mean, to me, it was, it was, you know, instead of going into the classroom and, you know, giving my lecture and I was, you know, very good at giving a lecture, but it was still a lecture. Yeah. Instead of doing that, I was essentially going to be, you know, letting go of my um, being the leader and and being the teacher and uh, do these other activities, which would put the the students and the group, you know, in the center of it. And I I mean I still can remember as as I'm talking about it, I'm remembering the first time I tried some of these things in a classroom. And I was so nervous, you know, like, what if it doesn't work? And what if no one wants to participate? And, you know, um, and it worked great. So uh, you know, then I got more and more bold as time went on. Um, but it can be, uh, you know, it can be a little tough. And I would think that for you, definitely, I, uh, you know, you must have gone through that. But even your participants must sometimes go through that with, you know, like you said, you know, there's this expectation, right, that they are, they're, they need to participate and that uh, their participation and the level of, of that is what really makes or breaks the group. Yes, I very much agree. And uh, we probably also reinvented the wheel ourselves uh, you know, listening to what the smart folks at the center for 
accelerated learning have known for what it sounds like for decades. And, but I think we've been rooted in digital, which is a fast moving field, a lot of moving parts and ever expanding scope no established sense of the answer is here and that's the definitive answer and we know this the answer that's a mammal and that's a fruit and that's a vegetable uh, uh, and so this the need in my book for meeting as a peer group has been has been even higher the that that need and and, and still, it's a hugely competitive space. Uh, there's a lot mm -hmm. of people out there who wants the attention of these people, mm -hmm. who wants not only to connect with them on LinkedIn and so on, but also want them to go to their seminar and go to their conference or buy their consultancy and buy their workshop. And, and we've been struggling, to be honest, about, you know, here's a group, it costs money. It's not, you know, it's a relatively sizable investment in time. It's four full days plus perhaps a little bit of travel and to get value out of it you probably need to throw in an additional day spread out over the year mm. to connect and and they're like what you know yeah. and then you don't have the answers you know you can't even tell me like i don't get i don't have <laughs> the internet at the end of that i yeah. don't have you know my you're right this is a, this is a hard sell a yeah, that's... <laughs> what are you kidding I, I need to do that then on top of it <laughs> No, and it's uh, it's definitely true. I mean, in the states, I don't know if you guys have. There's been, I guess, kind of a revitalization of the meetup group, and there's been a number of apps um, that have basically allowed anyone in an area to, you know, you create a, you know, a group, and then people can find your group, and and you can you can start it. But um, it, some of them are definitely more successful than others, and. Some of them turn exactly into that where, so it's a free group. And so it's like this, it's like this, uh, networking -y event. So they have, you know, of like, events and even if they're structured perhaps in a way that facilitates group discussion, um, there's a, there's a certain transactional quality to it. Uh, I, I'm showing up so that I can get these contacts so that I can be more successful at business and other people are showing up so that they can get their contacts. So, so it's like, it's like this, it's, it's kind of a, a schmooze session, um, at least when it comes to more professional oriented groups. Um, that is not true in the like knitting groups, I'm sure though. I, I don't attend them. So I guess I can't say, um, but having a, a, and I mean, that's one of the reasons I guess that I haven't because I've because I've thought about joining a group, um, but I don't. Well, it's it's tough because I don't really have a profession, which is that's maybe my first problem. But uh, the, the other thing is, is that um, when it, the, the, the groups that I would look at, they do. They, I guess I guess it, it is an, it's intimidating to uh, to 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 do it. And, you know, you just like show up and you have a drink and you talk to some people and you hand out some business cards and then you leave um in a certain way i think i'd i personally might be even more comfortable in a smaller setting um with with less people but that's just me yeah that's right. you're agree, pretty you know. good schmoozer <laughs> well i mean i can schmooze but like why like like th then 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 i'm just at work <laughs> <laughs> like, right? Like, if I'm just gonna go there and like hand out business cards and schmooze and like talk to people about like what they're, what they do. It, I mean, that's 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 just networking and getting leads, and that's yeah, that's not that's fun. not yeah, that's not learning for you. No. So the com the comparison to meetups is a very good one because many people know meetups and they see the value of meetups, and many people are, you know. Meetups normally start because somebody's really passionate about something they want to learn more about, be it analytics, be it design, be it all the million different topics that you can go to a meetup about. The way I position a peer group to a meetup is that there's a lot, there's a huge difference in terms of commitment. 
meetup you can kind of just go it's informal it's normally not held during working hours it's more in the afternoon evening and people just go and whoever is there is there here what i'm what i'm trying to design as a part of our project is groups that have a sense of continuity it's not necessarily the 16 same people each and every time but should be at least be the same 12 13 people so you can really build relationships and and that you can see them grow and even in Denmark and with everything I said earlier, Scandinavia about you know working as a groups and higher sense of trust, still here most people need to meet once, if not twice, before they just share everything openly about things that they are not sure about and want to learn more about. Um, and then, of course, it's a big difference that the, this costs money because it's time consuming to to create that experience. So meetups are normally free or sponsored by some sort of vendor with some other agenda. And then it's in working hours and the other one is not in working hours. Yeah. Yeah. So how many groups do you have going currently? We have almost 60 groups going in Canada, the East Coast of the US and then 11 different countries in Europe. So, and and if someone is listening to um, our podcast episode and says, wow, I, I'm interested, I'd like to be part of this, can they, I mean, can they request to be part of it? Do they have to be invited? Absolutely. How does that work? No, 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 absolutely. Uh, we have a website, jboye.com, jboye.com. They can have a look. We, we put there quite plainly the groups that have, uh, not all the groups we have active, but the groups that have available seats. Uh -huh. And that's still a lot of them because there's always this natural kind of evolution, people changing jobs, etc. So they can have a look. Um, they're also totally fine to take a look at our recipe that we try to also describe as openly on the website as in this podcast. And then they can roll their own if they like in Michigan or Milwaukee or Wisconsin or wherever they want. All right. Now, before we uh, before we end here, do you can you tell us a little bit about the the now that we've talked about how the groups are better than conferences? Now, talk to us about your conferences. <laughs> yes. Uh, so, I agree with the point earlier, which is a you know good way of putting it, is that when you don't have a lot of vacation, then when your employer says you can go to this conference, there's a there's a big need, bigger need perhaps for uh, social events or having fun in different ways. The design idea behind the conference, because I, I go to a fair p p number of conferences, I've gone to a fair number of conferences since the late 90s, and some are better than others. Uh, the design idea from the beginning was to make this a space for learning and networking and not for sales and marketing. Certainly in the digital space, however wide or narrow you define it, a lot of these events are really mm -hmm. vendor agency events, uh, sometimes with great speakers, uh, high quality talks, but it's really a vendor or agency event. And this idea here was to roll something independent where you can come for three days and learn. We have workshops, there are 45 minute sessions, there's 90 minute sessions, uh, different lengths learn there's ample of, t of breaks there's a real lunch not just like some lunch you would get on a plane which i've seen at many conferences not not the greatest food we really prioritize that there's a city walk so you can get a little bit of fresh air and talk to your peers outside the hallways um, but we also really engage with each and everyone who's on the program and so a little bit like a TED conference, we don't just let speakers from the circuit loose and say, hey, come over and give your normal talk, but we work with them and say, let's make it less large, let's make it more interactive, let's give you some feedback in advance in a friendly and constructive way, because we know the audience, we know who's coming, and then hopefully it gets to be better for all. And I've heard a lot, in particularly also again here in November, who's never had that kind of experience, whether from a participant or from a speaker. They've never had somebody who said, let me review your slides and give you real meaningful, helpful feedback. And also from a participant, uh, they haven't gone to conferences where it's not wall-to-wall -wall PowerPoint slides or uh, there's time to discuss and there's a moderator who might jump in and say, hey, 
You just said that. I know who there's somebody here in the room from IKEA who has a totally different view. Let's discuss. So, so I have two two quick thoughts. The first is, I've never really understood why people who put conferences together um, don't have less speakers and more time for analysis and thought and break in Q and A for two reasons. First. All of the wonderful things that you just mentioned, uh, and it helps breed a sense of relaxedness and uh, really digging into points and time for Q&A and all this fun stuff. And second, it would just be way cheaper. If you just had less speakers, it would be cheaper to put the conference on. I, I've never really understood why. <laughs> Certainly also less work, you know, yeah. and that's. Yeah. Hearing it from a person who's learned the hard way. Yeah, you need less AV people. I just, I, anyways. Yes. So I, I, I don't. I've never really understood it. Um, I mean, I and I suppose. I mean, I, I guess the argument for it is that people go because of a certain speaker, and if you have a ton of speakers, then in theory you can attract a wider audience. But um, so that's part. That's the first thought. The second thought is is that uh, your conference is it's just a very, it's a very different. Um, market for, for example, conferences in the U.S. Um, in, in my opinion, so first of all, that's like that sounds like a conference that's for the participants that are there. Uh, in my opinion, especially for U.S. conferences that do have, again, these conferences in the U.S., a company will pay for their employee to go to a conference, okay? And the only the, the reason that the company pays for the employee to go to the conference is because at the conference they think, well, that employee will schmooze and hand out business cards and, you know, maybe if, if we need some vendors, you know, they'll find someone good we can work with or, you know, someone good can find us. And so it's a business transaction. And so if I pay money, I'm happy, I'm happy to pay money to send my employee there, not because I care about my employee in the slightest, but I want, you know, this employee to be an ambassador for our company at, at this place with other people who have companies that spend money. And so the conference isn't for the people who are at the conference. The conference is for the companies who send the people to the conference. Um, and so there's this underlying uh, corporate thread because, that, because it's, it's, it's the uh, corporate thread that is the glue and it's the corporate sponsorships that make the conference happen. Even if the conference is technically run by um, a nonprofit, you know, local UX professional chapter or, or marketing chapter or whatever it is, uh, there's just this underlying uh, corporate facilitation that's that's happening. Um, and so the idea of having a conference. Uh, that that is trying to maximize the benefit for the people at the conference is a somewhat new and foreign one to me, who has also been to a number of conferences. Not nearly as many conferences as as uh, both of you, though. Uh, I, Susan, how many conferences have you been to? <laughs> I could not begin to tell you. Over a thousand. Definitely. Yeah. It's kind of yeah. I mean, as a, as both, if we include both being a speaker yeah, and a participant, sure, sure. yeah. But I think that those are really good points you said there, and I felt that pain myself. I one year we had uh, somehow I pushed my will through, and the team and the role models I described earlier, the great people on my team, we had eight parallel tracks over three days. You know, eighty speakers, a wow. lot of work, a lot of things that could go wrong, and egos and what have you. And then we've also had. Uh, a lot of you know a lot of sessions up to five in the same day you know boom 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 and it's really hard sometimes to find out when you ask people you know uh, why did you sign up and you know people will say there was this on the program there was that on the program and we certainly or perhaps I should only you know include myself here interpret that in a way that from a sales and marketing perspective it's advantageous to have as much as possible in the program because more people will find enough that they can justify making the trip. Mm -hmm. But once they are there, right. <clears throat> let's have the least on the program so that we can have an open space and people can talk about 
not what we thought was relevant in January because you know November is 11 months later but so that they can have an open space and we're trying I think we're somewhere in the middle right now but certainly moving in the direction that you're saying that you know we're gonna tell you on the website and the program here's what it is we're still gonna have some people who flies in from the US or elsewhere in the world but we don't want them to come over just to give a lecture and then fly off. We don't want hit and run speakers in general. Mm -hmm. Come and connect and be a part of it. You don't have to stay up till two in the night and sing karaoke or play table tennis or <laughs> be up early in the morning and do the cold swim in the ocean or whatever else. But be a part of it. And that really fundamentally changes the learning experience. So you have, uh, you have one in uh, Denmark in November, right? Yes, and then we've had one in Philadelphia from 2009 until last year, and then we we didn't do anything in 17. Uh, we're not going to do anything in 18 either, uh, but we have big plans to do something in North America again in 2019. 2019. It's, it's uh, there are, I and and it's the the conference world is so crazy right now. There used to be. Um, a couple giant conferences, mm -hmm. and we've just seen in in our in my and I think Susan's as well opinion, we've just seen this huge uh, frac fraction uh, mm -hmm. where now there are a trillion little groups, <laughs> and every group has a conference, and there's so many conferences, especially yes. on the small and medium sized, um, and it's yes. it's really eaten away at the big ones, and uh, it's it's. A lot of competition out there. Um, yeah, so. which actually we don't mind because it's opportunity. <laughs> Good for you. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> no, I, but but no. some of these smaller conferences, and I know in in the states some of the what's what are now considered regional conferences um, are really excellent, and it, you know people. And I think one of the reasons people like those, uh, you know, where the, the group has instead of having. You know, the national organization has the conference once a year, which they still do, um, in, and they pick different cities, right? And in, in, in addition to that, then the local group will have their conference and they'll have it uh, in their local city, you know, every year. And these smaller conferences, I think because of some of the things we're talking about, like the ability to network and learn from each other and see the same people um, over and over, uh, you know, every, each year. I, I think those have become extremely uh, popular, and um, so I, I, you know, I think it's a good thing. But it, yeah, it conferences are are interesting, and I, I we're I'm hoping. Uh, we might get to uh, your conference in November. We've talked about that, and we we don't know for sure if that's happening yet. But uh, I I'd be really interested to uh, to have the um, to have the Giannis conference experience rather than uh, I'd love to have you. Um, love to have you here. Well, well I I really want to thank you for joining us uh, today on this call. It's been interesting and. Um, we will post. Uh, yeah, it's it's amazing. Work. Another hour has flown by. Oh, I know. It's we happened. just start talking and the just time melts talking. away. And now we're done. Um, but we will post <laughs> your your website uh, address, uh, which you said was. Well, give it to us again, and we'll post Jayboy. it. Jboy.com. Jay Any, anything else oh, fun buddy. that you want to plug? Well, there's so much uh, happening out there at the moment, but uh, I would just say, you know, thank you very much for listening. It's been an interesting conversation. I've learned a lot also from hearing your reflection, and I think that's what happens in conversations like these, and it's amazing with modern technology that it's possible to connect across different time zones, across different cultures and countries, and so... Just thank you for having me. It it is. I as just as a quick note. It is truly incredible. It sounds basically like you were in the room next door, <laughs> rather than right. Like how many times? Like you are you are fourteen thousand miles away. I just I don't think he's that many miles away. But there's, he's in. Uh, there's no latency. He's in Copenhagen, so there's that is... no latency. 
I, I know. It's crazy. We we take it all for granted. I know. Giannis, thanks so much for joining us and uh, stay in touch with us. Thank you. Uh, thank you all. Okay, goodbye now.